next week. Um, okay, Paul, over to you. Okay, yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, very, It's a great pleasure to present here. And um, I should mention that this is joint work with um, Gunesh Gokman, uh, Michel Le Breton, and uh, Shlomo Weber. Um, so in this, in this uh, paper, uh, we're trying to answer the question, uh, did the Cold War produce uh, development clusters in Africa? And it's, you know, it sounds like a, a simple uh, uh, question, but it, it's a complicated exercise that we end up doing. And uh, hopefully I'll convince you that uh, it's worth doing. Um, but um, yeah, I think regardless, we, we get some interesting results in the end. Okay, so what's the motivation for this? Um, so if we, you know, if we look at the, you know, this flag of Angola on the right kind of ev evokes this image of the, 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 uh, the flag of the Soviet Union, uh, this, uh, the hammer and sickle, right? And uh, clearly, you know, what's interesting about the Cold War uh, period uh, um, for Africa is that it coincided with this, um, this moment of, of decolonization and push for independence. And uh, there were uh, also uh, super, the superpowers were, of course, interested in, uh, in having a competition for their global influence, and that played out in Africa as well. Um, and so, uh, you know, we could, you know, I don't think we have to argue too much that that the Cold War left uh, a, a mark on the continent. Uh, and and the question is, uh, you know, how how do we think about that, and how how uh, what what was the impact? And uh, you also notice that in the flag, you know, or, or, um, uh, that you know we have this machete and this gear that symbolizes the uh, the merging, the union of agriculture and industry. And so this is very much um, a, a very much a story about about development, right? And so, and in the the Cold War, these the the blocks, the superpowers. Um, you know, one could argue with this, but uh, they clearly represented different ideological approaches, um, and some may even argue incompatible uh, ideological approaches. And so we're going to kind of argue that, you know, when you have this, because this coincided with these, this push for independence, that you all of a sudden African countries, you know, had a huge range of, of decisions to make. And in those, when there are many decisions and, and it's quite complex ones, uh, this gives a role for a reliance on ideology. Uh, and so, and if we combine this with the idea that, you know, there's path dependence in your ideological decision and also path dependence in, in development strategies, then we imagine that this could be, there could be a pretty good potential for, for long run effects on, on development. Okay, so, you know, did a particular Cold War ideological alignment here, we're gonna, you know, take a, a take a stance on uh, what we mean by alignment in Cold War. And here, we're, as development, uh, as a development economist, I'm particularly interested in, in uh, uh, the development strategies that were pursued and, and whether uh, the development outcomes uh, produced, that were produced, uh, whether we can see whether there's an ideological divide in those outcomes in Africa today. So that, that's kind of where we're going. And if you think about the ideological divide, we, we, we think of two or three main uh, outcomes that we're gonna look at. The first of, of course, is uh, uh, kind of differences in income per capita today. Um, this is, you know, both, both ideologies uh, wanted to uh, expand economic output. And so this is an important variable. Um, you can also think that you know different ideology, the different ideologies uh, had differences in in their idea about inequality and how important it was uh, to have um, uh, to focus on uh, whether you know to manage inequality that comes with uh, ex expanding economic output. And we could also expect kind of differences in in the the role of, of financial development in in producing that that uh, increase in the economic development. So those are kind of the differences that we're thinking about. And we're gonna contrast this view. Uh, you know, some would say, okay, the, probably the ideology didn't play a role at all, that 
you know, if anything, the Cold War, you know, was was just this uh, very disruptive process uh, that that caused, you know, widespread uh, 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 widespread uh, problems on the continent, and we shouldn't really accept expect too much differences depending on this particular ideological alignment, uh, and we'll talk about we'll talk about that as we go along. Okay, so why do we think, you know, we think this, of course, question is very important, but uh, as social scientists, we also think of this question as pretty interesting. Uh, um, there's a problem that we have to solve that, that hopefully I'll convince you is, is a more generalized problem, um, although this is very much a special case and how we approach it is very much a special case uh, to, the, to the Cold War environment. Um, and so here, if we think about, I think we think about the story of the Cold War in Africa, um, another very important aspect of it is, you know, we have this push for independence, but also a push for decolonization and a turn inwards towards other African countries and, and a promotion of African unity meant that, you know, a particular country or, or leaders of the country or citizens of the country we're not only looking at the superpowers for, um, for uh, as examples of, of development, but they're looking towards each other, and and as what to what to do. And in in some ways, they wanted to ignore this, uh, ignore what uh, the superpower influence, and fight against this influence, as as uh, to to decolonize uh, their their um, their institutions and and so on, um, and. And on the superpower side, you know, we can think of uh, them thinking about, you know, not having too much knowledge about, about Africa, at least in the beginning, and thinking about this as basically a zero sum game that if a country aligns with the, the other, other block, then that's a loss. If it aligns with us, it's a, it's a gain. Um, so we kind of, our, our approach here, and I'll, I'll be more explicit about it, is really to kind of abstract from the superpowers interests altogether. And focus on uh, the agency of African countries to to pick their particular uh, block that they want to be in. Um, now we so this is this is of course going to be important for how we think about uh, the the assignment of alignment. Um, but we're also running into some problems. You know, I'm not an expert <laughs> on uh, on the Cold War. I'm not an expert on on Africa at all. Uh, and so, as an economist, what do I do? Well, I look at what historians are writing about it, what maybe some political scientists and and uh, and others, and I try to try to learn from experts about what 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 was going on. And but if we look at the Cold War history of Africa, it's actually pretty incomplete, um, and and there's also a lot of room for ambiguity in how we make that assignment. Um, and so we actually don't have a. a Kind of a we don't have a perfect alignment that we can um, that we can measure uh, that we can use as a as a as a measure of of a, a Cold War alignment. So we could of course turn to other kinds of ways that people have tried to do this. We can look at official alliances. These are of course problematic for a number of reasons. We could uh, Firon has tried to look at alignment based on arms trade, but clearly this. Is goes against our the spirit of our exercise. This this very much accounts for superpowers' interests, and in some sense, it's endogenous to uh, quite endogenous to lots of things that we might be worried about. And then there's uh, uh, we could just take expert analysis of case studies, you know, go one by one and try to make an assignment. Uh, but here, we we run into um, several issues that are well known. Of course, to historians and and um, and also political scientists, uh, but I think uh, less so less appreciated in economics. So I'm so if I uh, I probably um, you know very much understand the the world as an economist. So I'm probably neglecting some important literatures here. But uh, the history, you know, this the role of contingency in history makes for uh, difficult difficulties in in constructing counterfactuals and so there's been a lot of criticism of uh you know the whole treatment effects approach to to history matter the history matters literature and economics 
precisely because of this, because it creates these weird, strange counterfactuals, also counterfactuals of, of convenience. Uh, and so we're going to try to try to address, try to find a, a little bit of a middle ground here where we allow for contingency. We take seriously this problem of, of constructing counterfactuals and and um, and uh, and I'll try to make that clear. But more importantly, from just from, you know, even if we believe in this kind of treatment effect approach to history, um, given these social interactions, you know, we're, we're going to violate, mo most likely violate the standard, uh, you know, SUPFA assumption that we make. And on top of that, there's going to be many different potential outcomes that we could consider instead of the common uh, approach where there's just two uh, potential outcomes, um, you know, the outcome with the uh, with the treatment alternative and the outcome with the hypothetical, uh, you know, not not where the treatment alternative is not available. Okay, so how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to use uh, theory to not we're not going to model the development outcomes. We're going to model the alignment itself, uh, and so we're going to try to use theory to determine uh, to narrow down the set of potential outcomes that we have to look at. Uh, so. Um, you know, basically, we're gonna we're gonna be agnostic in the beginning. We're gonna allow for all potential outcomes. Uh, any any particular alignment becomes a counterfactual uh, outcome of interest, um, or or, or uh, sorry, a counterfactual um, um, allows us any any particular alignment becomes a, a counterfactual uh, that we'll want to enumerate. Um, but we're going to use theory to tell us which outcome, which potential outcomes are important to look at. And so we're gonna use a game theoretic version of landscape theory. So if you, you maybe some of you know this paper by Axelrod and Bennett where they uh, predict how the axis and allies, uh, allies powers were, would, would fall and actually they get pretty close to the, the prediction um, in during World War II um, by using just the likelihood that two, to, by the by using the the bilateral relationships between countries and the likelihood that two country any pair of countries would would be to to cooperate with each other and then they build that up to come up with uh you know different way different alignments uh in in our case it's going to be the, the two blocks in the cold war and we're going to focus on the nice thing about doing this game theoretic, they, they didn't have a game theoretic foundation for their landscape theory, but we we apply that. And so the nice thing about doing that is that we get this, we get this way to describe different equilibria uh, and in particular, how stable uh, the equilibrium, we expect the equilibria to be. And uh, we're actually gonna focus on one particular very stable uh, configuration. Um, and this is gonna give us exactly two potential outcomes per country. Uh, and so then we're going to, once we have these potential outcomes, then we're going to uh, assign a treatment assignment based on the correlation between this focal parti partition, which we're calling, and UN voting patterns during the Cold War, so that the assignment's going to be at the block level. It's just the aggregate correlation that's going to give us which which the, the exact alignment west or east. And then, of course, we'll assess the robustness of the correlation um, through various ways. And then once we have this focal partition, um, so we've spent a lot of time developing this you know, right-hand side variable. Now we're going to turn to the left-hand side variable, what we're really interested in, and in seeing how uh, different development outcomes relate to this focal partition. And of course, we'll control for the initial level of GDP per capita. Uh, there actually isn't great data on, on the initial level of other other outcomes, um, but I'll try to I'll discuss these initial conditions a little bit as we go on. And um, of course, since we're assigning things at the block level, we're going to use uh, randomization inference uh, to to do our hypothesis uh, testing. Um, and then I, I'll do some various exercises. At time, I'll go into it. So let me. I know that's a kind of a long <laughs> introduction to our approach, but. Um, if there are any questions uh, here, I can, I can, um, well, let me give you a preview of the results first, and then I can, I can allow for uh, any questions there. So what we find is basically this focal partition, this really stable configuration of the continent, 
basically splits the continent in, in half. Uh, we have this north-south divide. That's going to raise some uh, some eyebrows for, for some from some of you. You can think of lots of different correlations between these that, that we might be concerned about, and we'll talk about that. Um, but this was completely you know, an endogenous alignment that came out of the model. Um, there are other stable partitions that do not follow this geographic uh, configuration that we can look at. Um, and then uh, what's interesting is that, you know, this focal partition predicts uh, aligning with the, with the U.S. or the USSR uh, in these U.N. roll call voting. And it, and it predicts it during the Cold War period, but not, not after. Uh, and so then we use this prediction, like, like I said, to assign the alignment. Um, and then uh, if we look at outcomes, there are uh, countries that um, are you know, aligned with the West or aligned with the US. Um, there's, there's no statistically difference, in, no statistically significant difference in incomes per capita today. Um, there's higher inequality. Uh, and there's a higher uh, uh, financialization or financial development in, in the Western aligned block. And these effects are pretty large. So um, for inequality represents a jump from the median uh, to the 75th percentile uh, and, and a, a similar magnitude for, uh, for uh, financialization. Okay, so I'll pause there. Uh, any, any questions? Yeah, Paul, there is a Question about why Madagascar is part of the North? Yeah, so I mean, this is a uh, yeah. There there are some peculiarities. Like so, and also we see uh, Guinea Bissau and and uh, Liberia and and um, and and Ghana as part of the the South, <laughs> which uh, is also uh, uh, um, an issue. But this is you know we don't so. This is an outcome of the of the game, and so I don't have a particular um, explanation for for why it's there. Um, it's just that you know this ge this geographic pattern emerges from from the game. We don't impose any kind of pattern. Uh, we allow for all possible configurations. Uh, so there's uh, you know two to the forty six possible co uh, configurations, and this is the one. That is selected, the unique one that's selected as the the most stable configuration. And I'm sorry, I can't see the labels. What is the red and what is the blue? So I, I didn't want to get into that at the at the moment, but yeah. So this, <laughs> uh, but but this. Uh, so the important point. There's two important points here. The um, the so these two different blocks represent the counterfactual. So the the two potential uh how we're thinking about the two potential outcomes so either these group could have been in you know this the the red group could have been uh assigned to the to the to the us the the blue group could have been assigned uh to the to the uh uh ussr in this potential world but when we do this un voting correlation it just happens that the blue group goes with the us and and the red group goes with the ussr thank you yeah. Sorry. no i don't you go ahead please uh, yeah um did you allow in your in your modeling for a third outcome like a non-aligned group yeah so great question so in this particular setup we we've only we're so we have to specify the number of groups uh you know uh before we do this exercise uh, there's not a, an endogenous number of groups, but um, but so we just restrict attention to two groups here. And the logic behind that is that, you know, we're really interested in this ideological alignment and and we want to force kind of each group to pick one 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 ideology or, or the other. But of course, the non-aligned movement was very important. And um, and we have other work where where we're looking at two versus three groups as as uh, which which kind of better explains uh these un un voting patterns the two or three groups where you allow for a third group that possibly a neutral group um but for this exercise we thought it was the more straightforward <clears throat> and simpler to just say okay you have to 
pick a development strategy that follows one ideology or development strategy that follows the other. Uh, and, um, and the superpowers themselves uh, didn't really believe that, uh, that, you know, it was only a, that this non-aligned movement meant, meant very much. They, they basically thought that uh, they could influence these, these countries eventually to, to one side or the other. Um, uh, but yeah, you raise a very important point. Um, so for here, we don't allow for yeah third third group. Um, was there any transition? I mean, there was a long time the Cold War. Was were people sort of if you look at your um, map there uh, in terms of the voting? Let's say I mean, did people change positions from aligning with one or the other um, in terms of the you know let's say you. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so it, for our notion of alignment, they don't change. It stays fixed over the whole period. Um, but of course, if you look at other uh, measures of alignment, like official alliances, or um, or you know, you could use technical assistance or arms trade or other things, or or the leaders' preferences, right? All those change over time over this 30, 30 40 year period, right? And uh, and so that's but that's part of our one of the empirical issues that we face that um, that really what we're interested in is uncovering you know because there is this path dependence in developing strategies we think that that kind of the this uh, and because these decisions are very complex that you kind of need this stable reference point um, to to uh, to 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 understand your development process, and and so we kind of wanted to uncover whether there was this stable uh, stable configuration in which to engage this difficult process of of development. Um, but you're right; if you look at other notions of alignment, they would they would change over this time period. I mean, um, I was just thinking, in, even yeah. in terms of the development strategy, it might be that there was learning going on that one country saw the other one with. The, the different alliance having a better, let's say, growth or whatever, and and they they adjusted their alignment accordingly. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. That's definitely going on, and um, so you think of this, you can think of this. What we're capturing is kind of a intent to treat effect, and and there's lots of lots of things, and so going on, and so if we kind of tried to measure the the. Um, you know the effect of the of the, the average effect on the on the treated we run into lots of different other problems that that make that that kind of estimation exercise very difficult lots of endogeneity and selection bias uh, and so yeah this is kind of where we see ourselves on on safer ground on this <clears throat> in this respect <clears throat> sorry excuse me but we certainly are not telling the full Full picture and not giving the um, you know not giving you the the precise information that you might want uh, from this exercise. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. But um, so uh, the uh, so if we look at you know the Cold War alignment in Africa, um, you know just to give you a sense of. The problem we encountered when we were diving into this is, you know, really there, there. Well, as of when we started this project, <laughs> there hasn't been a, a general history of the Cold War in Africa. There's certainly a general history of the Cold War, um, and so if you look at, say, uh, you know, this, I could cherry pick other uh, general histories, but if you say the Cambridge history of the Cold War, you basically in this three volume set, there's only two chapters that kind of mention Africa, uh, and uh, and and they're pretty generic, right? One is the Cold War in the Third World, and uh, another is Cold War in Southern Africa. Here, you know, you have some really important uh, military interventions, and those kind of get covered uh, in there. And then, as we already discussed, there was this non-aligned movement that that you know already in 1958. You know, we have um, uh, you know Africa. Uh, Con the, the continent being very receptive to this non-aligned movement in Nkrumah's uh, UN speech calling for non-alignment. And basically every country, every African country joined the non-aligned movement um, 
uh, and most of them did early on in the 60s and, and some a bit later in the 70s. So, you know, from that point of view, you know, if you think about Cold War alignment, you know, maybe we're, we're doing this exercise in futility. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's clearly we can't escape the fact that there is this mark of the of the Cold War on the continent. And we see, you know, over a third of African countries experienced foreign military interventions by the superpowers. We coded up, this is not exhaustive list, but it's the best we could find, over 800 kind of Cold War events that, that reflect economic, technical, and military assistance between African countries and the superpowers. Um, and so, you know, clearly there's, there's, there, there, there's evidence that there is this, this history is important. Um, and then let me just go through a brief example. Um, I want to get to the, uh, the meat of the paper. Um, but so we have this, you know, let's just think of this case of Guinea. Mo most people think this is a pretty easy case to classify. Uh, and it's a co consensus case that it should be aligned with the USSR, but it's complicated. So they decided to have this, in, you know, they were the first to, des to declare independence by, by a refer referendum vote uh, from France. And they decided not to join the other French uh, colonies uh, in this respect. And France got upset. And so they punished uh, Guinea by withholding uh, finance. And so uh, this made things difficult. And so they turned to uh, USSR to, to help. And to, and to get assistance early on in the beginning. And, and the USSR influenced their development strategy. We had nationalization uh, of industry, lots of large-scale investment, modernization of agriculture through collective farms, and so on. Um, but in the end, this didn't produce much, uh, you know, there's still, the inf you know, if we fast forward, infrastructure is, is not there, uh, modernization is, is, uh, and is, is not there. Um, and uh, and even you know uh, Secutore, you know he moved to uh, the West throughout this period. So even this kind of consensus case is uh, we end up classifying Guinea as as uh, as Eastern Align, but uh, it's not it's not clear, and it's clear and it's also represents that you know if you wanted to classify uh, Guinea as Eastern Align, they did so. As in response to a, ne a severe negative shock to their uh, uh, their uh, ability to access finance, and so that introduces endogeneity. If we look at these specific country histories, okay. So that's that's one of the just to highlight kind of the problem. Okay, so let me go kind of uh, unfairly. I'm going to go quickly through this game of 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 social interactions and get to the more interesting results. So. We have we think of this Cold War as uh, the history of the Cold War in Africa is really just a problem of alignment. Uh, we're grossly oversimplifying things, uh, but this is we got to start somewhere. And so we say, okay, countries are going to pick east or west, and they're going to pick this based on their bilateral ties with other countries that also pick east or west. Okay, and how do we look at the, how do we measure those bilateral ties? Well, we draw on this literature uh, on um, that uses uh, you know, different types of cultural factors, um, uh, historical factors, uh, geographic factors that would lead to um, more or less likely propensity to cooperate among, uh, among countries. And, um, and so we're gonna basically get a payoff. You get a payoff with, uh, if you align with a, a particular country and, and then you sum across the payoffs across those uh, uh, countries that, that also choose to align in that same group. Okay, so um, just to be, uh, so just to put some structure on it, so we're going to think of this, uh, so payoff is basically utility, it's going to be the sum of values of the pairwise relationships among those in the chosen block. This is going to depend on uh, the size of the importance of, 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 of a particular country, uh, and this is very much in line with what Axelrod and Bennett did. And it's going to depend upon the, the um, what we call, you know, the, this reverse alienation as a propensity to cooperate. And these are going to be distances between two countries, I and J, where these distances capture 
linguistic distances, religious distances, uh, ge geodesic distances, and so on. And so then we're going to look at two particular solution concepts. One is just the straight Nash equilibrium, where is there, you know, given what everyone else is choosing to do, would I be better off in the other block? If not, then it's a, in, and that holds true for everyone, it's a Nash equilibrium. But we're going to actually use the uh, a strong Nash equilibrium concept where we say, okay, given a particular configuration, is there any, is there, are there any groups of any size that would want to switch such that each member of the group would 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 benefit benefit from from switching? Okay, so this is a very powerful concept, it's, and it's uh, it creates a, for a very stable equilibrium, and we'll call this. It turns out to be unique in our case, uh, the focal partition. Okay, so what's nice about focal part the focal partition? Sorry, Paul, I think there's a question, Elena. Yep. Yeah, so I'm so I from what I understand, so the, the choice of block is based on the welfare of each country, right? The country decides whether to join or not. Right. But that's not the case. What about military factors? So like in DRC, they initially were aligned with the USSR, and then they caught the the US called uh, killed whatever the name of the guy was, I think. I forget the name of the leader at that point. So, and then Mobutu came and it was so much worse. So it's not like, I mean, it, it doesn't sound like to me, like in that case, they wanted, you know, they, they, they did it because the US came with military power and it doesn't sound like that's reflected in your model. In your model, it's like, oh, I'm going to choose this block because that's good for me. Yeah, exactly. So you're 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 right. And, um, and so what, so how we think about it is that this is kind of a, a tacit alignment that that disciplines the Cold War history. And so in some sense, the superpowers themselves, whether they know it or not, are responding to this tacit alignment. And in fact, uh, we don't do it in this paper, but if you look at the the payoff, the pay the minimal payoff that will be required to to have a country switch blocks. Um, if you if you look at the 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 if you look at the likelihood that there'll be a foreign military intervention in that country, uh, it's increasing in the size of this minimal payoff, and so we interpret that as you know if it's close if it, if the minimal payoff is is small, then you can flip a country by um, by giving them economic assistance or technical assistance, but if it's large, then you need to have this military intervention. But that's kind of a side point. Um, but basically, yeah, there's, so our notion of alignment is very particular. It's not trying to explain the Cold War history, but it's trying to capture the idea that there was this decision to align ideologically one way or the other. And once that decision gets made, it's very hard uh, to change because of path dependence and and so again, it's just like an intent to treat effect. Yeah. And so what's but what's nice about the the strong Nash equilibrium is that if say the U.S. does invade uh, or or some um, particular country gets affected uh, and and gets switched, say or or people perceive it to be switched, the strong Nash equilibrium says that even if that country deviates, it's not going to cause the the equilibrium to break down. Um, and so that's very powerful. Yeah. So what's interesting about, so again, this as already was mentioned that this, this focal partition kind of maximizes the size weighted social welfare. So, and we think this is an important concept since, you know, there was this push for African unity. We, we would want this, given that there was this problem of alignment, we still want to maximize social welfare uh, with this. And I've already talked about stability. And then perfect for us is that it gets uniqueness. So we, we've uncovered uh, many Nash equilibria to this game, um, 86 of them so far, and there are probably many more. But then we can look at the other kind of stable equilibria and ones that are Two groups stable are uh, groups size groups of size two stable, 
there's nine of them. Groups of size three stable, there's four of them. Groups of size four stable, two of them. And then there, there, then uh, there's, uh, you know, if we go down to um, our, our strong Nash, it becomes the unique one uh, once we go above the threshold of, of seven stable. Okay, so uh, I don't have much time, so <laughs> uh, but so this is actually a, a difficult problem to solve. It's a, a MP hard problem, and um, if you have a small n, you know you can probably use brute force, just calculate the number, the payoffs, and then decide which one is the the most gives you the most. Um, but in our case, it's it's difficult. It's computationally. Uh, not possible to do a brute force. And so we we realized that there's this parallel between our problem and this max cut problem. And there's a huge literature in computational, uh, uh, um, in, in computer science and, and computational methods that are specifically addressed to solve this max cut problem. They made amazing advances. And so actually we're able to recover the exact solution uh, using a branch and bound algorithm it's uh, the intuition is that you just, you know, this is a non-convex optimization problem. So you just relax it to allow for a continuous choice between say zero and one instead of the binary choice zero and one. And then this gives you an upper bound for the, for the, for the, um, you know, maximum. And then you can use a, a well-established uh, approximation algorithm to get the lower bound. And then, uh, and then you, just do this until you converge to the where the lower bound converges to the upper bound. Essentially, that's the story. That's how you do it. And so just to show you, well, I'll probably skip this for, in the interest of time. Um, but just to say, it's not trivial to show that this is a, a, a that you could do this with a max cut method. Um, okay, so what's the data we use? Well, we you probably already suspect we, we you just use world development indicators for the economic outcomes. We have these UN roll call votes, and then we have this propensity matrix that we construct these pairwise distances. Uh, we're just going to use uh, uh, the the um, weighted sum across these six dimensions, just to keep things transparent. We're going to allow for equal weights, and we're going to use any type of distance that has been used in the literature. Um, uh, you know that appears in the literature quite often to to that that explains propensity to cooperate. So we have genetic, linguistic, religious, and then we have geodesic distance con contiguity, and then we we'll also use common colonizer as uh, as um, factors in our um, in our uh, propensity matrix. And these should be you know relatively. Uh, of course, they're they're external. They're they're we imagine that they're they're appearing before. Uh, the Cold War, and they allow us to, uh, you know, tie our hands a bit into how this assignment works. Okay, so we have complete pairwise data for 47 African countries, so we'll, we'll, we can look, we can examine these, and then um, we we assign this treatment based on this aggregate correlation to the UN voting. You've already seen this this partitioning, right? So I'll skip that for now, but let me just show you that. Um, that if we look at uh, this, you know, Western aligned groups, they're predicting voting with the US over the Cold War period. Um, here we have just the robust uh, standard errors and brackets. And so you can see that this is by conventional measures, this is statistically significant at, at, at a high level. Uh, and, um, and, but one thing that you should be aware of is that overall among African countries, only about 11% voted with the US. Most of them are voting with the USSR. So this also indicates that probably UN voting alignment is not the best measure of, of this ideological alignment, um, but uh, it does help us in making this treatment assignment. So we do, I'm gonna skip this for interest of time. We do a lot of validation uh, checks to make sure that this is working. Uh, we look and show that uh, we we can our prediction our, our the stable you know the, this focal partition outperforms the other stable equilibria in predicting uh, UN voting outcomes and this is a robust to controlling for Cold War events 
like the, the one that was mentioned in the DRC. Um, and then uh, let me turn to the main set of outcomes. So these, uh, the, the ideological alignment during the Cold War and development clusters. So here we're gonna use GDP per capita post 1991, just the average of that. Uh, we're gonna also use income inequality measured by the Gini coefficient, again, averaged for the years that we have after post-1991. Here, the, the, the prediction is that, you know, the, those that aligned with the East should have uh, greater equality. Um, and the financial development cluster, since capitalism relies on, on the market economy, then you're going to have to have these decentralized decision-making. How do you do that? Well, you need a financial, uh, you need financial development to do that. So we're going to use financial account holders in the population after 1991 to assess this, uh, whether there's this cluster. Okay, so just briefly, so there's actually better information about inequality, um, uh, initial levels of inequality. Uh, you're probably wondering, okay, what did the level, the initial conditions look like? Well, if, in terms of GDP per capita, there's basically, I'll show it, there's, there's no differences uh, in, in 1950, um, but also in terms of other initial conditions, there's no clear pattern, um, and I'll, I, I'm going to skip it for, for now, uh, between different measures. This, why do we use the slave trade? Well, there's this paper that says uh, uh, by Ross Levine that, that the slave trade led to, led to greater financial uh, development. Okay, so, uh, uh, so here's the main results, and, and I'm running out of time, but um, if we just look at, say, uh, column two, three, and four, you'll see that this, you know, if anything, Western aligned are, are, have, you know, lower incomes per capita than, than Eastern aligned ones. Um, but there's no, it's really noisy. There's no, uh, statistical, uh, significant difference. Um, uh, I'll, and, and we, we can say that in a variety of ways. But you can see by the large <laughs> standard errors that it, it would hold for a, a variety of ways of calculating that. Um, and then for income inequality, we see this, you know, there's this increase in inequality for Western aligned countries and this increase in, in financial account holders per capita. And these are sizable effects. Okay, so then how do we tell that this is statistically significant? Well, we create these placebo uh, partitions and we do randomization inference. We do it a number of different ways, but this is kind of the standard way. We're just assigning basically a, a some probability, equal probability that you get in the Western aligned or, or Eastern aligned. And then we calculate the, we run the regression, calculate the T stat, take the absolute value and plot it here. And this is the 90%, um, or sorry, this is the 90% line. And this is our, the estimated effect that we, that we, that we have. Um, and uh, and uh, are the estimated T stat that we have, and you can see it clearly is statistically significant, um, and both for financial account holders as well. We also can run this as a joint hypothesis, and we get similar results. Um, we do a number of robustness checks. Um, so only in the last minute, let me just run through uh, uh, them quickly. Um, you have so, another five, six minutes, so don't worry about 45 minutes to think. So. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so so we do this, so you might be worried that, you know, we still, you know, we have this alignment, but this alignment depends on factors that, that you know, might be uh, related to development outcomes that, you know, there might be, we might violate this unconfounded, this assumption, even though we're able to use this uh, stable configuration to limit the number of potential outcomes. We still could have some uh, violations in our exclusion restriction. And so what we do is we take advantage of, we leverage these UN votes again, and we just say, okay, let's count, the, count let's view the individual likelihood of voting with the US, this is basically a country fixed effect, as the probability of being treated, and run a propensity score analysis. And so what's interesting here is that there has actually a lot of overlap between the two uh, countries in terms of their propensity to vote with the with the US, with the likelihood of voting with the US. And so here's the the this eastern block, eastern side, eastern block countries, here's the Western aligned countries, and you get a lot of overlap here. Although, you know, 
or Western, you, you get this must be South Africa or, or something like this, you get some extreme observations. But with the propensity score analysis, we're going to, you know, just look at, at the overlap part. And so we see a very similar estimates, particularly for income inequality and financial account holders, no matter how we do this propensity score, whether we use them as weights, whether we just control for it, or whether we use nearest neighbor matching. Uh, in fact, we get better results when we, when we do the nearest neighbor matching. And then uh, what we can also do is a theoretically motivated trimming exercise. I mentioned those minimal payoffs that we calculated before. And we can say, okay, is it the case that a country that's very far from, you know, switching blocks, you know, would require a very high minimal payoff to switch blocks? Maybe they're not a great counterfactual. So we eliminate those, we drop those. And so here's the distribution of this minimal payoff to switch blocks. And you can see that there's some, you know, problematic cases probably, we'd probably want to eliminate, maybe a, we, we eliminate ones that are greater than one and, and less than negative one. We also do it for 0. 0.5 and, and plus 0. 0.5, but we're, we're limited in the amount what we can do because of the, uh, because of the, you know, the small sample. <laughs> There's only uh, 47 countries. In most cases, we, we just have 45, complete data on 45 countries. So we do that. Results are robust. So again, focus on income inequality and financial account holders. Um, and, and no matter if we do this, you know, um, this, is, this is trimming at one, this is trimming at 0.5, um, we get similar results. So then finally, you might say, okay, uh, uh, you know, wh what about this north-south border? Is it just, are we just picking this up? And uh, so then what we can do is we can zoom in you know, we're just pe picking up characteristics that are typical of north, the, the north versus characteristics that are typical of the south. So we can zoom in on this border of the, of the focal partition, this north-south border, and we can say, okay, let's use luminosity data and compare the grid cells in this band. And then we can also move that border and, and compare above and below for kind of a placebo regression, which, I, uh, um, which we, we also did. And so we take luminosity data. Okay, what's the problem with luminosity data? Well, it only gives us a good measure of, of or some might even argue it's a bad measure, but uh, uh, of, of levels of income per capita. Um, but we, so we kind of created this measure of inequality using the standard deviation uh, within a 50 by 50 kilometer grid cell uh, and divide it by its mean to get a measure of inequality. And we'll say, okay, is inequality uh, greater or or uh, in in these in the southern southern part of the band, and so if you see these these uh, the regression discontinuity design, we do this kind of donut style regression uh, because of you know these confounding issues at the border, and you see that indeed there's higher inequality in the in the southern part of the border. I mean the southern part of the band, uh, and uh, and there's also you know, if you this looks like there's some a positive difference, but this is not statistically significant uh, difference in terms of uh, average luminosity per capita. Okay, so then uh, last I'll close shortly. So you might say, okay, why do we do all this business? Like you did all these things, why can't we just use UN voting correlations, take above median with the U.S. and 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 below median with the with the U.S. as as a, as our measure of alignment. Or why do we need to do this focal partition and all this business? Well, one problem with that is that these UN votes, you know, they're relatively costless to cast, um, and uh, and so in some ways maybe they're not the best measure of committing to ideology. But on top of that, we're not really trying to interpret. Uh, the Cold War alignment through UN roll call voting. Um, we want to be more disciplined than that, and we want to to we want to uh, have more structure than that. And, and but if we did that, you know, okay, this naive approach, just assigning based on these voting correlations, well, you actually get nothing. It's complete noise if you do that. All right, so. 
we think of this focal partition as kind of a tacit alignment. It gives us, it, it allows us to make this causal analysis by giving us a particular exclusion restriction that says that we can ignore lots of potential outcomes that we otherwise would want to consider. And this POCO partition predicts UN voting patterns during the Cold War, not after. It allows us to establish the, the assign, particular treatment assignment at the block level. And we find that Western line countries are more unequal, uh, but they have greater financial development. We also show that Western aligned countries have a little bit better human capital outcomes. Um, and so it looks, you know, if we, if, we, if we think of this as maybe the medium run, not the long run, maybe the Western aligned countries are a little bit more advantaged in the long run, but we can't, of course, say that. Um, uh, and, and another thing I wanna emphasize is this, this kind of, our method uh, is, is useful when history tends to be a little bit messy. And uh, and it's another way of thinking about how we how we construct counterfactuals when there's a lot of contingency and there's a lot of ambiguity, and uh, but we still want to answer this question. Uh, and so I'll stop stop there. Okay, great. Thanks, Paul. Um, any questions? Okay, so let me just ask about people are thinking. Maybe uh, I'm just thinking about. The, the mechanisms kind of which affect uh, the development. And I don't know if this is true or not, but um, is kleptocracy kind of, you know, corruption, level of corruption and stuff. Um, I don't know if anybody has looked at kind of, uh, you know, being aligned to, I don't know, USSR, you are more likely to stay in power longer and stuff like that, less dem democracy, maybe possibly more corruption. So this is coming in a way from the level of corruption or institutions, let's say, both political and economic institutions, um, which kind of explain the alignment effect in a way. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if this is uh, something of relevance here. Yeah. No. Absolutely. It's definitely relevant, and we we haven't done a great job with mechanisms in the in the, in the paper, in part because, um, you know, we we don't have uh, an, an extensive amount of data, but we did look at kind of like these intermediate outcomes that that um, like institutions and and corruption. We don't see uh, a difference in uh, you know to the extent that you believe these uh, corruption measures. Uh, we don't see a difference in those, but we do see a difference in the polity for uh, democracy score. So Western line countries score a little bit better on those, um, and uh, and it's a good suggestion. We didn't look at regime. Uh, regime stability, but you know that we could definitely calculate that and and look at that. Um, I mean, yeah, how long? For instance, South Africa is one, as you said, in a way that was an outlier. South Africa could be the like a reference point because that was probably the most democratic, or you know, kind of less, let's say, during that time, less. Um, yeah, the level of corruption was lower than possibly most of the other countries. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I mean, it has obviously other connotations as well because of the way it was, you know, run and stuff. But yeah, that, that, that's just one one idea of of trying to see some of the other mechanisms. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. Anyone else, Elena? <clears throat> Yeah, I was also thinking about the mechanisms, and I was a bit su surprised. I mean, I was trying to think why why would you get these data because. And you said that you find that the ones aligned with the USSR were le they had less human capital. Did, did I remember that right? There, I mean, there's some measures that suggest, yeah, like there's. Um, so if you look at gender parity in education, the uh, you you expect you would think that maybe the USSR would would score better on that, but they uh, they score worse on that. And yeah, then... because because there was a lot of uh, exchange. So the USSR established these universities in Africa, and then there was a lot of exchange of African students. They went to the USSR. I I don't know. If, I don't think that that happened with the US. So there was a lot of exchange, particularly in these, you know, uh, medical and science fields and things like that. And so if it's about ideology, you know, why, you know, we would expect that. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm that that kind of like doesn't. I'm trying. I'm yeah. I can't understand that. But is it because of trade? Is it because that 
you know, these countries were part of, I don't know, they were like trading grains or whatever it is. Um, so I'm also I'm also wondering, you know, about what, what the mechanisms are. I don't think you can test a lot of it because your data is, you know, you have 45 observations there. But maybe yeah. some something anecdotal, like I, I know about the universities and about the exchange. And so that, but that kind of doesn't really um, you know, fit in with, with what you find. But Ellen, I think that's the the fraction of the population that gets to that level is so tiny it will not show up, right? Like what's going to show oh, up is the, yeah. the overall averages because it's a country level, yeah. But there must be uh, what what is well, why is it like this then? Why is it um, is well, it is it because of money or whatever? I don't know. Yeah, the share the share of it, another uh, the share of the budget going to education. Is also higher in Western aligned ones, so that's that might be part of it. That the there was a you know if if you can go abroad to get your higher education or or you know then then you're not you're less likely to develop at at home. I don't know. That's just I don't know whether that's true or not, but that that could be one potential explanation. Um, but I think you're absolutely right. We don't have the data really to get at a lot of these mechanisms. And what I would love to do is is basically get a bunch of disaggregated data on uh development projects themselves and and uh and look at you know development projects by by the soviet union development projects by china development projects by us development projects by Cuba or or, or whatever and and do a very like disaggregated analysis um, but yeah right now we're just looking at very Did we lose Paul or did, is my internet problem? Can anybody, any, someone? Yeah, can, he's, he's frozen. Okay. Yeah. He's frozen, yeah. <clears throat> well, that's certainly a way to end a seminar. <laughs> Well, it was good to see everybody. I have a nine o'clock, so I have to jump. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Take care. Right. I think you'll probably uh, log in, log back in. Uh, so I'll, I'll stay on anyway. Let's stay a few seconds here. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> no, I'll stay. I think he. He may try to re-enter. Yeah. That's right. Wait for him. At yeah. least okay. uh, say goodbye to him. Yeah. Oh, there he is. There he is. Yeah, he is. Yeah. Paul, nice to see you. I don't know what happened. Yeah, I think. No, I, no worries. Well, we wanted to say nasty things about you. So, we... <laughs> yeah, so he kicked me off. And, yeah. 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 No, that's great. I think I don't know if you were in the middle of some uh, response, but I, if you remember it, then you can finish it if you want. Um... Oh, I, I was saying, so I'm not sure when I got cut off, but I was saying that um, what I'd love to do is that, that I, already say that yeah the disaggregated and uh, yeah, yeah, disaggregated, yeah yeah but i think yeah i think we could do we could do more with the data that we have but yeah we're very limited with this small sample and very aggregated data yeah yeah okay so we'll it's a good time to finish uh thank you so much paul uh for a very interesting uh talk and um as i said i think in the email as well if you wish to make it as a uh, discussion paper GLO, then we can put that next to the you know with the, with your um, uh, video of the talk as well. So that uh, that be that be good. Okay, so thank you. You. thanks again. That's very much. Thank you, and um, see you the rest of you next uh, month. Okay. Bye. You. Bye bye.